Class, let's begin. Uh, this morning, I think, or sometime this morning, I can't remember. Uh, homework six showed up on Canvas. Um, this is uh, uh, this is primarily uh, about implementation. There's just a little bit of theory which actually is going to inform your implementation. Um, I know some of you were not excited that homework four was had no programming, so this one is mostly programming. Um, um, so I'm sure at this point all of you are happy, or all of you are unhappy. One of those. Um, and uh, uh, this homework might take some time for your code to run, more than the implementation itself. So I encourage you to start ASAP. By the end of today's lecture, you should have everything you need to do the entire homework. So uh, start as soon as possible. This code's gonna the uh, the experiment part of it will take a bit of time. Um, this involves two or three data sets, right? Oh, yeah, so we've created three data sets for you um, that uh, uh, we're not going to share what the underlying true concept is. Um, there's something interesting about those three data sets is all I can say. Uh, and uh, I want you to explore using SVM and logistic regression on it. And optionally, uh, for extra credit, there's also a new kind of an ensemble that we've described in the homework. Where you train some decision trees, decision stumps actually, on the data, and then treat the decision stumps predictions as features and train an SVM on top of that. So it's like an ensemble of decision stumps, but something that we've not seen in the lectures before. It's extra credit. If you want to do it, do it. Uh, if you do it, you might you could also choose to do it for your uh, project. Um, the nice thing about the SVM. Uh, and logistic regression implementation is that in both cases you'll be implementing uh, stochastic, excuse me, stochastic gradient descent. Um, so in both cases you'll have uh, uh, code that kind of structurally looks like your perceptron code. So not average perceptron, but the batch perceptron where you have an, an outer loop over epochs and inner loop over examples. Before the inner loop, there's some shuffling, and then there's like this update step. The update step changes from each of for each of these things. So uh, this could also give you some opportunity to revisit your old code if you're interested. Uh, there's a question on uh, Zoom. Will there be homework like homework three before the final? Unfortunately, not. Uh, simply because we don't have time. Uh, April twenty fifth is the last day of classes, so we can't have another homework before uh, the final. That. I, I don't think I'm allowed to give you homeworks during the exam period, right? I mean, you could, but then you can give a final thought. Sorry? You can give a final project and just have a final project. I know. Well, I can have a final project and an exam. We have that. In fact, we do actually have that. What we, What is kind of borderline uh, uh, cruel is also to push a homework on you at that time. <laughs> um, so I'd rather not. Instead, I'm going to create this uh, a document that kind of summarizes the kind of thing, everything that we've seen. And maybe, maybe uh, if I'm able to actually manage the time, uh, even create like a practice final. Um, the final will look like your midterm. So if you want, you can think of your midterm as your practice final. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, or alternatively, uh, your midterm is... Uh, since your midterm is uh, kind of smaller, your final will be for two hours. Um, uh, so yeah, either that's a good thing, you have more time, or it's a bad thing, the misery is prolonged. Uh, one way or another, you have two hours. You can choose not to be here for all the entire two hours. Um, anyway, uh, I also wanted to remind you uh, about all the things that are gonna be on your plate for the next few weeks. We are coming close to the end of the semester and like all ends of semesters, things kind of pile up at the end. Um, there's homework six that's due on the last day of class, that's uh, April 25th. And then there's the final project submissions that need to happen. And that would be the last day of the exam period, uh, which is May 3rd. And it so happens that uh, our exam is also on the last day of the exam period on May 3rd. It will be in class 
Uh, there's some time that has been allocated for us, which I do not remember. It's on the class website. I'll look it up and uh, put it on an announcement uh, afterwards. Any questions about any of these things? The reason I have this list here is just to kind of remind you that there's going to be a whole bunch of stuff coming your way and uh, um, uh, you know, just organize your time. So I'll get you in a minute. I noticed that I've been missing a bunch of room questions. Um, there's one question that says, uh, if I want to use decision trees as weak learners for Adaboost, should I build the decision trees first and then feed the pre-built models into Adaboost? Actually, or alternatively, sh uh, should we train the decision trees or whatever we weak learner we want inside the Adaboost where we call the weak learner? Um, technically speaking, you could do either one, but I think the latter is better. So the latter here is you have a, in, inside the Adaboost loop, you have a set of examples and a set of weights for each example. And you need to, uh, I, I would suggest train a decision stump, not a decision tree um, on those weighted examples, rather than having a pre-built set of trees from which you choose one that has the lowest weight. You could do that also, uh, but, there is a uh, the, that brings up the question: How do we make sure that the decision tree that you learn satisfies that distribution? So you know you want examples that have high weights to have low errors. There are a few different ways of doing this, and I'm going to uh, um, describe an approach. So let me maybe first tell you tell you what the question is in a little bit more detail. This might be useful for your projects uh, for everyone. So suppose you have uh, the Adaboost algorithm looks essentially like for t in one to t, you first construct, you have d, uh, uh, d zero here, you initialize it with a uniform distribution, and then you have, cons uh, uh, let's say h t is called on examples and the distribution at this time step. The second step is update the dt of uh, plus one and then alpha t and epsilon t and all that. So, uh, you know, there's a lot more detail that I'm sure uh, we, uh, I don't need to talk about, but the interesting point is, how do I call a weak learner on a set of examples and also ask the learner to respect this distribution, right? So all the learning algorithms that we have seen so far, don't do that. All they do is they take a data set and produce a classifier. But here we are saying it's not just a data set. There are some examples that are more important than others. How do you force it to respect the distribution? There are two high level strategies that you can use uh, for any of these stochastic gradient descent based methods. Uh, you can, so uh, for any SGD type method, and I'll answer the uh, question that came up uh, on decision trees after I talk about SGD, any SGD type method has an update that looks like the weights are the old weights plus some, not plus, minus the learning rate times the gradient. I'll just call it gradient of this example, right? Let's say you have a weight for that example. If a, if a certain example is very important, you want its impact to be more than an example that's less important. So a very simple way to do that is just to change the learning rate uh, so that for that example, if the step size becomes proportional to the learning rate. So if an example is important, you take a longer, a bigger step. If the example is less important, you take a smaller step. If an example is completely unimportant, if it has a weight of zero, well, there's no update because we don't care whether the example, you make a mistake on that example or not. This means that you have to be careful about choosing your learning rate because you are kind of multiplying by number between zero and one. So your learning rates are all shrinking all the way through. So you may have to you know, do a little bit more careful hyperparameter tuning. So this is the approach for any SGD type of model. This uh, is easy to implement. All you have to do is, you know, change how 
your learning rate uh, is decided. What's that? Uh, uh, that's just a constant. It basically becomes part of your hyperparameter search. You have to be you have to be careful about hyperparameter search. So that's for SDD type things. But let's now consider the other case where you have the decision tree uh, learner. The decision tree learner has no such update. You take the entire data set and you just uh, need to do the uh, compute the entropies and uh, the ID3 algorithm works. You know how it works. So it turns out there are there's you can try to be uh, clever and invent uh, sort of a, uh, a, a, a change change the definition of entropy so that important examples get more represented and less important examples get less represented and that way uh, you you could do this you can basically not do this but you can construct a, a tree where important examples get higher weights but I'm going to suggest a much 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 easier approach. What you do is you have a distribution. Let's uh, let's use an example here. Let's say I have uh, five examples, and let's say the D here. Let's say the indices are all examples here, and let's say this is one fifth. Oh, let's make this. This is point one. This is point two. This is point zero one. Point four nine. What do I have left here? And point three. I think they add up to one. Okay. So uh, they add up to one, right? Yeah. Um, so let's say that this is the distribution we are currently sitting on. Uh, and no, they don't add up to one. No. Yeah. Okay. Now they add up to one. Um, so uh, let's say this is the distribution we currently have, and we need to respect this. So example three is really unimportant. Example four is really important. What you could do is construct, take a, uh, uh, the idea of bagging. In bagging, you construct a, a data set by sampling uniformly from the, from the uniform distribution with replacements. Instead of sampling from the uniform distribution with replacement, you sample from this distribution with replacement. So you construct a parallel data set for this particular round. So example, you let's say that you sample from this distribution and example four shows up. You, you, you call the sampler again, example four shows up again. And let's say four shows up here, five shows up and two. Now you've constructed a data set with five examples where of course the fractions are not, not perfect, right? And 0.49 uh, means that a little less than half should be example four, but we are sampling with replacement, and if you have a large enough data set, it will be close enough. And now you can call ID3 on this data set. So notice that example four shows up three times. So its uh, contribution to all those entropies and all that will be much higher. And so that means that you don't need to change anything in your existing code. All you have to do is before you call the decision tree sampler, inside this thing, before calling uh, the calling the weak learner involves first uh, pulling out a sample that's from that distribution and then calling your weak learner. Notice that that also works for these kinds of algorithms. You don't need to change your learner at all. Just resample the data, respecting the current distribution, call your learner, and then update the D and all that. You get a new distribution, resample the data, the original data from the original data. Uh, when I say resample, you need to draw samples with replacement according to this distribution. In NumPy, if you're using NumPy, that's one function call. It's I think numpy.random.choice or something. Uh, don't hold me to it. I don't uh, understand. I haven't seen the latest documentation, but something like that. So this means this kind of gives you like an easy approach for uh, using Adaboost on any uh, learning algorithm you've seen so far. There's uh, another question, which is much more practical. Uh, well. I think Adaboost is also very practical, but uh, something that is uh, quite relevant, will the final exam be cumulative? Uh, the answer is uh, it will cover everything that we've covered, including and from learning theory. So from computational, so starting with the uh, theory of generalization, back learning, and all of that, all till whatever we do on the last day of the lecture.
Did you have a question? Yeah. So for home on six, you mentioned that running that could take quite a while. Yes. Like, how long is quite a while? Like more mm -hmm. for like when you park in the game. Do you have a sense? Well, uh what is training for the training? So the largest the largest because there are uh hundreds of instances probably between five thousand. Five thousand one will take quite a while. Fifteen minutes. Fifteen minutes per hyperparameter. No. Including hyperparameter selection. And that is for him who's taken this course and done really well. He has code that works. He works on machine learning. Um, it might take like, you know, a little long. It's also five-year-old code that he wrote when he was a student in this class. So um, it could take long, not because of that, but for a slightly different reason, which I realized, uh, which I, I, I realized only a few years ago, around this time of the year, of the, of the semester, Many different classes have heavy homeworks that are all occupying the CAD machine. So you might have to fight off other classes. Um, so I would say get it done. Uh, there was once when I, uh, one semester, I gave a homework for machine learning with a data set of like, I think 10, 20,000 examples with a few thousand features. And this was a, at that time, the class had about 150 students. I got complaints from other faculty that I was taking over the CAD machines and not letting them do anything. Um, yeah. Anyway, uh, other questions? Just make sure you plan your time. Um, things are coming your way. Uh, the, another uh, related point in terms of logistics, all, the, the fact that we are only two weeks away from the end of the semester, also means there's a rush at, uh, from my side on trying to cram as much as possible into these two weeks. Um, today, we're gonna to talk about logistic regression. On uh, uh, Tuesday and Thursday, we'll talk about neural networks. And on Friday, I'm going to fit together whatever else I can, uh, in, but focus primarily on practical advice on how to deploy machine learning. Uh, it's not gonna be like a, a or how to debug machine learning code, which you might say should have been the first lecture, but it's going to be the last lecture. All right. So, any things about any logistics and such things? No? Okay. Let's start a new unit today and hopefully complete it today. We're going to talk about logistic regression um, to kind of uh, step back and see where we are. Uh, we've already seen the idea of linear models. We have uh, already encountered the idea of learning as loss minimization. We have encountered two different criteria for Bayesian learning, namely maximum a posteriori or MAP estimation and maximum likelihood estimation or MLE. This is MLE estimation. Okay. Uh, um, so what we... Uh, are going to do today is it turns out that we're going to look at something that connects all those things together. We'll first look at the definition of logistic regression. Logistic regression is a new kind of a classifier. So anytime you see a new kind of a classifier uh, or any new model, you should ask yourself uh, the same, almost the same set of questions. The first one is what's the definition? What's the functional definition of that classifier, of that model? Because if you do not, if you cannot understand what's the functional definition of the model, that means you cannot implement it, you cannot deploy it, you cannot analyze it. Sometimes it's also worth asking what kinds of mathematical functions or what kinds of classifiers or decision functions can this model family represent? For things like logistic regression, that question has an easy answer. For very complicated uh, uh, things like neural networks, it becomes a little hard. So that's the first quest, the set of questions. What is this function? The second question is, if I give you a data set, how will you train that classifier? So it's the learning problem. The third question is, if you give me a new example and a trained classifier, how do you make prediction? These are three different questions, right? One is, what is the functional definition? Second, how do you train? The third one is, how do you make prediction? And uh, understanding all these three means that you have enough information to probably uh, deploy, uh, you know, uh, actually implement it or use it 
and be certain or at least have some idea of when this might have cleared up end. So let's talk about logistic regression and uh, you know keep this checklist in your mind. The first thing that we'll look about, uh, we'll talk about is where can we apply this? We're still talking about binary classification. Our inputs are d dimensional features. So we are assuming that somebody else has done the feature extraction for us. We have feature vectors. We are, called, we are going to call that x. Our labels, uh, this is a binary classification task. Our labels are minus one and one. Um, and the, uh, you know, to kind of, this, for the, for, from the point of view of training, we assume that uh, we are operating in the supervised setting. We assume that we have a training set S consisting of XI and YI. We have M such examples of uh, labeled uh, of labeled uh, instances. Logistic regression is the name suggests regression, but it's actually uh, a classifier. The output is discrete. Either the, the output is one or minus one. But instead of building a model that can actually predict the output, what we will do is we will build a model that predicts the probability that the label is one for the, any example. Probability that the label is one given an example. If you have this probability, then you can threshold this probability at half or wherever you want to kind of convert it into a decision function. This is the important difference between logistic regression and the other things that we have seen so far. Uh, there's a conceptual difference. In logistic regression, we build a system, we build a model that produces a probability that the output takes a certain value. And because probability is a real number, turns out that uh, it behaves, the, what, what we'll do next can be seen as a kind of a regression problem. It's not any kind of regression problem because if it was any regression, the, out, the, the, num the output that produced it could be any number from minus infinity to infinity, but we want to produce a probability. So it has a particular form. So in other words, our hypothesis space is not the function, uh, is not the set minus one uh, or one, but the range minus one, this is poorly written. So minus, but the range minus one comma one. So the, you can produce take in the the output of the model that we train can take any uh, um, uh, number between can produce any number between zero and one for an example. The original problem produced only minus one or one, and we are going to uh, modify the problem. The same d-dimensional vector, the input feature, gets mapped to a probability, and as a result, um, we have modified the the original problem definition into a regression problem. Now, if you think about what kinds of functions can map a vector to a number between zero and one, I'm sure if you spend some time thinking about it, you can invent like 10 functions very quickly. It's not without knowing anything about logistic regression. So we now have a choice of which family of function we're going to train. So our hypothesis space, uh, uh, the, the choice of the hypothesis space is still something that we need to con uh, consider. Logistic regression makes a particular choice in that regard. And to make that choice, it takes advantage of a class of functions called the sigmoid function. Uh, the, the hypothesis space for logistic regression, I'm calling it HW of X, because remember, this is H produces a number between 0 and 1. HW of X. It's all functions of the form. I'm calling this sigma uh, as a, sh a shorthand for sigmoid. Uh, all functions of the form uh, where that, that do the following. The input features come in. First, the function has some internal weights. It takes the dot product of the weights and the input features and then applies the sigmoid transformation to that. When you take the dot product, you get a number. A real number. Then you apply the sigmoid transformation to that real number, and that is the output. The sigmoid function is uh, simply this function here. For any number z, what it does is uh, it converts it into, uh, it, it outputs 1 over 1 plus e power minus z. This, this function is called the sigmoid function, or the squashing function, or the logistic function. And 
when you uh, think about what's going on here, uh, the output of the logistic regression classifier is the is an expression that looks like this: one over one plus e power minus w transpose x. So input comes in. First, take the dot product of the input uh, features and some weight. Implicitly here, I'm assuming that there's a bias term. Right? I've not written the bias term following the convention that we've been using throughout the semester. In some discussions of logistic regression, the bias term is always explicitly written. So you take the input features, you take a dot product with the weight, you get a number. And then given that number, you apply the sigmoid function to that number. So you get one over one plus e power minus that number. And this may seem like an arbitrary choice. Like, why do I pick this? First of all, I need to convince you that this expression can only produce numbers between zero and one, because that's what that's what the contract demanded. Um, if you stare at this function enough, a uh, little while, you might see that it is actually um, the, the domain and the range of the sigmoid function satisfy all the properties that we want. The sigmoid function, if you plot it, it looks something like this. Um, this is not three fourths of Z, the sigmoid of Z. Um, so the input Z can be any real number. Uh, and the output has to be a number between zero to one. It is a number between zero to one. And you take uh, the output is, uh, a, it produces this, uh, has this famous S shaped curve. Um, as the input becomes larger and larger, the output becomes closer and closer to one. As the input becomes smaller and smaller, it becomes more and more negative, the output becomes closer and closer to zero. An interesting uh, case is when Z equals zero, you get sigmoid of Z is one over one plus E power zero, which is one divided by two. At when the input is zero, you get probability equals half. Before we talk about this function, any questions about this? So the domain of the sigmoid function is all real numbers. The range is the uh, the uh, something that you know could plausibly be a probability. In other words, it's a number between zero and one. Is there a question? Yes. It cannot be exactly zero or one because for the sigmoid to be equal to one, for the output of this function to be equal to one, the value of Z that makes it one is infinity. The, for the value, for the output, for the, the output of this function to be zero, the value of Z should be negative infinity. So the only way you can get uh, exactly zero or exactly one is when uh, at the infinities. But for all practical purposes, I have found that you know more than six or ten, you get such close numbers to zero and one that it's not going to matter too much. Questions? Those of you who have seen uh, hyperbolic function. Uh, this function has the same shape as the tan h function. In fact, it's just a linear transform of the tan, tan h function. Just a anecdotal B there. The sigmoid function has some rather satisfying properties. So because we're going to operate in this world of uh, gradient-based learning, an obvious question to think about is, what's the derivative of the sigmoid function? So, can someone kind of quickly work this out? So imagine that you have the sigmoid function defined this way. This is a function of one variable. V is a real number. What's the, the derivative of the sigmoid function with respect to its parameter? Well, it is one divided by one plus e power minus v square times the derivative of the numerator, which is, what did I do here? No, this is a minus one. Did I miss something here? Oh no, that's right. So then e power minus z times minus one. 
which is e power minus z. And I'm going to, you have a square here, right? I'm going to partition split that into a product of two things, divided by one plus or minus z times one divided by, right? Well, this is exactly the sigmoid function. And if you think about this a little bit, this the first term here, this is one minus the sigmoid of z times so the derivative of sigmoid function is simply one minus the sigmoid of the the one minus the sigmoid times the function value itself you don't have to worry about uh the reading my notes this is the same thing written a little bit more compactly questions about this now the reason i'm showing you this is because uh, for two reasons first of all um, when you actually need to use stochastic gradient descent or any gradient based method for the sigmoid, you need to actually come perform this operation. So that's important. The second thing is uh, for your homework. First question in your homework asks you to take the derivative of the loss function for logistic regression, which means somewhere inside, you need to actually take this or uh, perform this operation. Questions? Let's go back to logistic regression. Logistic regression uses the sigmoid function. It defines, I mean, this is a modeling assumption. You might ask, does real world behave this way? I don't know. Logistic regression assumes that the probability that the label equals one for any example, assuming that the weights of the parameter are W, probability of Y equals one given X and W is the sigmoid of W transpose X, which is one over one plus E power minus W transpose X. Which because we also know that the probability of uh, the, the output y can either be plus one or minus one. This immediately means the probability of y equals minus one is simply one minus the probability of y equals plus one given x. I'm writing w here just to kind of remind you that we also need the weights uh, to actually compute this probability, which is one minus p of y equals one is exactly this quantity here. Um, but sigmoid has this nice property, one minus sigmoid of W transpose X is one minus one over one plus, which is minus one. And this term and this term cancel away. So you get the expression E power minus W transpose X divided by one plus E power minus W transpose X. Well, you can do something more there, which is, I can let's move all of this away. This expression, I can divide, I can multiply both sides, e power plus w transpose x divided by e power plus w transpose x. I can multiply and divide by e power w transpose x, which is, and I'm writing this here. So these two terms cancel each other out. So I get a one divided by one plus e power w transpose x. So the probability that the label is plus one, let's just erase this thing. The probability that the label is plus one is one divided by one plus e power minus w transpose x. The probability that the label is minus one is one divided by one plus e power plus w transpose x. I can put these two together and compactly say, so this, this expression is the same as this. I can put these two together and compactly say uh, 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 that the probability of Y given X and W is one divided by one plus E power minus Y W transpose X. We did a whole bunch of work and then we are back to that same expression minus Y W transpose X. Y W transpose X keeps coming up. We saw that in perceptron, and we said that's what we used to decide whether there's an error or not. We saw that in SPM, one minus y w transpose x was deciding whether the classifier should have a penalty or not. In logistic regression, minus y w transpose x again shows up. So um, it's just it seems like this is just like a accident because of our choice of the, sig the sigmoid function, but 
we chose the sigmoid because it has all these interesting properties. Questions? How many people have seen the sigmoid function before? What three, four? Okay. Five. Okay. Uh, those of you who have seen it or who have not seen it, any questions? Yeah. I don't know. Maybe it goes around committing crimes. I don't know what you mean by bias. Um, let's come back to that question next week when we talk about neural networks. The sigmoid function is, in some sense, a perfectly reasonable uh, choice if you want to produce probability. It has interesting, possibly not so nice properties when it's uh, this function shows up somewhere inside your neural network. But at the output, which is where we are focusing right now, it's perfectly reasonable. Other questions? This stuff is actually not particularly hard. Uh, and the reason I say that is because I've shown you nothing so far other than the definition of a function and uh, shown you what, you know, what it looks like and how it behaves. All I have done so far is define the functional form of the logistic regression classifier. The logistic regression classifier actually produces a probability that the output is one given uh, uh, an input. And the way it does that is by essentially uh, it uses a weight vector internally and constructs uh, and quashes the, the resulting score using the sigmoid. Um, a minor detail for now, uh, I don't thought it's got some interesting uh, um, uh, you know, extensions to think about, but related to the point that we discussed at the end of the previous lecture, the logistic regression classifier directly models p of y given x and not p of x given y and p of y. So this makes it a discriminative classifier and not a generative classifier. Uh, if that lecture kind of felt too quick and uh, didn't really uh, stick, don't worry about it. So what, what have we done so far? If I, all I've shown you is what's the logistic regression classifier. There are still two questions left. The first one is how do we train the model? The second one is how do we make predictions? Uh, did you have a question? I have a question. Which one? How do we, which one? For where is my homework? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. What I do? I know it classifies them. So, like, how does it classify the homework? Right. So, that's really a question about the third part, which is how does it make predictions? If I give you a new input example, how do you how do you make uh, so yeah it's a good segue because uh, that's literally the next slide. Um, if you if I give you a new example, how would logistic regression decide whether the label should be plus one or minus one? All it gives you is a probability that the label is plus one. What we do is first we compute the probability that the label is plus one using exactly what we've seen so far. That gives us a number between zero and one, and we can threshold that number if the uh, that probability is more than a half, you predict plus one. If that probability is less than a half, you predict minus one. So that's a simple answer, right? Why half? Because half is, uh, uh, you know, you know nothing about uh, the label otherwise. If you had some other preferences, you could in inject it right there, but half is a safe choice. Now, did, does that answer your question? I mean, that's you don't seem happy. Well, I think now, like if we're pressuring like half, isn't that the same thing? Even though the weights in the weeks. That is in terms of exactly right. So I could ask the question that's written at the bottom. If I threshold the probability at half, what does that mean in terms of just the dot product w transpose x? So let's uh, uh, derive that because that's kind of Simple and fun. That's simple. So the decision is plus one if sigmoid of W transpose X is greater than or equal to half. 
If sigma of W transpose X is greater than or equal to half, that's the same as saying one over one plus E power minus W transpose X is greater than or equal to half. I can uh, reverse the sign of the inequality by taking the reciprocals. This means one plus E power minus W transpose X is less than or equal to two. I remove one on both sides, E power minus W transpose X is less than or equal to one. Now I can take log on both sides because you know I don't want to really take the exponential. Uh, this implies minus W transpose X is less than or equal to log one, which is equal to zero. In other words, I have W transpose X is greater than or equal to zero. So the decision is that what the logistic regression does, the classifier does is it predicts a plus one if the probability of one is more than half. That's exactly the same as saying it predicts a plus one if W transpose X is more than zero. What we have here is a linear classifier. Logistic regression is just a linear classifier in disguise. Another way of thinking about it is if you have a linear classifier and I need to produce probabilities out of this, the scores that you get, well, just take your W transpose, the score that you get, and apply the sigmoid function. And that gives you your probability. So, converting the score that you get from a linear classifier into a probability. Your mind should go to the sigmoid function. So the prediction process for logistic regression is rather simple. You train it to you, you, you know you def, we've defined it as something that produces probabilities, but turns out it's just the same as a linear classifier. But because we have this ability to produce probabilities, we can now put a, put a Bayesian hat on uh, on ourselves and examine this object that we have, namely the logistic regression function from a Bayesian point of view. And in particular, we can define Bayesian criteria for training the logistic regression classifier, which we could not have done with SVM. Or, uh, sorry, not SVM, which we could not have done without actually getting into this world of probabilities. That's the reason why this, uh, this is kind of cool. So, short answer, Predicting a label with the logistic regression function, well, you have a linear classifier, so the prediction is simply the sign of W transpose X. Questions? Did you have a question? Questions on Zoom? So we had three, three uh, uh, things in our checklist at the beginning. We needed to see what the logistic regression function was, or sort of what the logistic regression model did, and turns out it produces these probabilities. We needed to see how prediction is done. Well, prediction is done using the sign of the uh, weights, the dot product between the weights and the features. There's only one thing left. How do you do training? Uh, so that's going to be the focus of pretty much the bulk of the rest of today's lecture. So let's dive into uh, training a logistic regression classifier. And this will be the third instance where we will uh, look at a somewhat detailed uh, version of maximum likelihood estimation. And then after looking at maximum likelihood estimation, um, we'll see what can we do with priors. Can we add priors to the over hypotheses and then go from MLE to map estimation? So let's go one step at a time. Let's first talk. Yes. Um, you could actually, that's a very good question. You could set a threshold to be something else. Uh, let me give you two scenarios where that might be helpful. Let's say that you, you, have a, you have a model that produces probability, for an example. But you, the, 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 and let's say you're going to deploy the system in some uh, real life scenario. And you find that the risk of predicting, of mispredicting something as a one is much higher than the risk of mispredicting something as a zero. Then you say, uh, the evidence I need to 
call from example at level one should be much more than just 50% probability. I need 80% probability for something to be one. Otherwise, I'm going to just you know call it a zero or, a, or a, yeah, minus one. So then you set the threshold to be that. So that's one scenario where you set the, uh, that's one sort of a situation where you can do that. that that's the threshold of just, you just move the threshold to uh, uh, away from how. It turns out, you, you, I'll leave it as an exercise for you to think about what that does to the W transpose X situation. That's, it turns out that's exactly the same as instead of setting the threshold to be zero for W transpose X, you set it to be some positive number. I'll leave it as an exercise. Uh, I mean, it's kind of simple to prove that. Another scenario where you could do, where you could do something different and then threshold, just thresholding at a half is you have two thresholds. You have a, let's say that your classifier, your model produces a probability. And you say, if it is more than 75% probable, then I label it as plus one. If it's less than 25% probable, I will label it as a minus one. If it's between minus 25 to 75%, my classifier will refuse to give a label because it's actually uncertain. So you can you can use the probabilities to only label, uh, reduce labels where your classifier is certain. You can again apply the same question, uh, this, this point, this uh, uh, thing, uh, what I described, the two threshold situation to so the W transpose X. In that situation, in, in, with W transpose X, what it would do is if W transpose X is more than some big positive number, some positive number, you label it as plus plus. If it's less than some negative number, you label it as minus. And if it's between, you know, close to zero, between uh, between some uh, say minus six and plus six, or minus three and plus three, you refuse to label. So you can essentially apply the same argument both at the probability uh, in the probability space or in the, uh, the in the score space. And you know. The, this assumes, of course, that what we have are actually real probabilities. Very often when we train models, it turns out that we do not get real probabilities. And when I say real probabilities, I mean uh, something in a very technical sense. If you're interested in follow following that up, look up the word calibration, calibration of estimating. Uh, that's kind of a fun topic that uh, can become a exact, you know, uh, exploration of its own. But you know, th does that answer your question? Yep. I feel like the same one function can also be implemented in this direction. Now, I thought it was really better for an ensemble security because you can just you can weight it down on the probabilities rather than just looking for cross matching. You could ensemble the, uh, you could take a weight, weight, okay, that's kind of odd because you're adding up probabilities and you might end up with a number that's more than one. One thing that is done is uh, normalized product of the probabilities. Um, you multiply the probabilities and then you kind of normalize it so that minus one and plus one, the probabilities add up. That, is, that idea of multiplying probabilities of a committee is called product of experts. Uh, product of experts was first, that phrase was first introduced in a 2002 paper by Jeff Hinton. And it's like a, Sort of a cheap ensemble. You train multiple logistic regression classifiers and just multiply the probabilities. Um, and uh, you do that for the plus one case, you do that for the minus one case, and whichever one is bigger, that's the name. All right, all good questions. Uh, let's move on. Let's talk about training a logistic regression classifier. Um, we are in the supervised setting, so we have a training set uh, consisting, let's say, of M examples. Our goal is to find a weight vector. The weight, if we knew, if we had the weight vector, we can compute the probabilities for any new example. So the goal of learning is to find the weight vector. We are operating in this probabilistic or Bayesian setting. In particular, we are trying to find uh, the maximum likelihood estimate of those weight vectors. Remember, in maximum likelihood estimation, we want to maximize the, among all hypotheses. We want to find the one that maximizes the probability of the data given the hypothesis. In the notation on the slide, the data is the set S that we have, and the hypothesis function that we have is uniquely defined by the weight vector. So our goal is to find weights such that P of S given W is maximized. Okay, so now uh, 
every maximum likelihood estimation process in some sense follows a similar sort of a template. First step, you assume that all your examples are IID, because if they are not IID, then you kind of get into very hairy probability situations. Let's not go there. So you assume that all your examples are uh, independent and uh, identically distributed. What do we do next? Any thoughts? So our goal is to construct P of S given W, where S is this set of uh, labeled examples. So in the, we use the fact that they are independent, but not independently, they're independent of each other. So you have the probability of uh, S given W, well, S is a list of things, a set of things, and each item there is independently sampled from every other thing. So this is exactly the same as the product of probability of XI comma YI given W because they are independent. So our goal is to maximize overall examples P of the data given the weight, which because they are IID is the same as the max uh, is the same as maximizing this product uh, over each example. And here, instead of P of X comma Y given W, I've written as P of Y I given X comma W. Um, I'm not gonna tell you why, uh, I think I mentioned this somewhere in the last lecture, and I'll leave it as an exercise for you to think about, but it turns out this is the right thing to do. Well, the next thing is almost like a formulation. Once you have constructed this expression, the next thing to do is to just take the log of this whole thing because we don't want to work with product. So we can work with the sum. So the log of this quantity here is simply the sum of i equals one to m log p of yi given xi and w. So the log of a product is um, the sum of the logs of the individual things. Okay, so solving this problem is equivalent to solving this problem, which is equivalent to solving this problem. Well, we now need some way of defining the probability of y given x in terms of the weights. Luckily, we know exactly what that is because this quantity here, according to the definition of logistic regression, this is exactly sigmoid of yi w transpose xi because that's the definition of the logistic regression classifier. For any example, the probability that it takes the label y given that the input is x is uh, the sigmoid of y w transpose x because the weights uh, is, and this is a function of the weights as well. So that and we know what how this what the sigmoid function looks like. It's one over one plus e power minus y w transpose x. Yes. Yes. If it is more than two labels, uh, it turns out that a very similar thing works. A very, very similar thing works. And in the literature, the, the multi-class extension of logistic regression, instead of taking, instead of using the sigmoid function and then taking the log, you will use the softmax function. Some of you may have heard of this uh, name called softmax. Softmax behaves like the sigmoid function. It squashes real numbers to produce probabilities. And you take the log of that and the whole thing works. Okay, so I, uh, so I need to take the log of this quantity here. Log of that whole thing is simply the negative log of one, my, one plus e y i w transpose x i. Right? Log of one divided by anything is the negative of the log of that thing. So I can put this right here and I can rewrite it. So maximizing uh, over all the weights, the sum of log of P of Y given X is exactly the same as 
maximizing over the weights the summation of negative log one plus e power minus y w transpose x. So far from the top to the bottom, I have really done nothing particularly intelligent. All I just did was follow this recipe. The first step, we knew that our data is, uh, examples are independent of each other, so I can treat the probability of the data given the model, which is the likelihood term. I can write it as a big product, product over each example. I don't like working with products, so instead I'm going to take log because log is an increasing function, so it does it preserves the maximum. So I can take log and I can work with the summation over log probabilities. This expression here, uh, the summation of log probabilities is also called the log likelihood. We have the log likelihood of the data. In particular, because we are working with this uh, assumption that our uh, model is the logistic regression model, P of Y given X uh, has this, this specific form, the sigmoid of uh, negative, the sigmoid of W trans, Y W transpose X. So I can just plug that into this and you know just apply simple algebra and refactor and i get an expression my goal of learning now is to find the weight uh, the weight vector that maximizes this summation here any questions before we examine this thing and try to understand what's going on yes why did argmax change to max uh, mostly because i got lazy um, we are trying to solve, which is why I did not say uh, it's the same as, I was very careful about one thing, which is I said it's equivalent to solving. In order to find the argmax, you need to do the max. Um, and it turns out that argmax is kind of a little bit slightly more tedious to typeset. You know, we live for the little pleasures. Questions? Let's, uh, let's stare at this a little and try to see if uh, we can uh, make sense of this a bit more. Our original goal was uh, to perform maximum likelihood training of a, a discriminative classifier that produces a probability. Uh, and that particular classifier uh, used this logistic model, namely the sigmoid function, to define the posterior probability of the label given the example. This box here really says in very, very big, big words, things that could be much simpler, but I just wanted to put it all into this uh, box because uh, you know sometimes you might hear these words. We have the logistic model for posterior distribution is simply saying that P of Y given X has that sigmoid form. We are doing maximum likelihood training because we are maximizing the likelihood of the data. We have a probabilistic classifier because, well, we are producing a probability. It's a discriminative classifier because it's P of Y given X and not P of X comma Y. So our goal was to train and do this thing. This is what we started off doing. And in the end, um, we came to this expression here. Um, I, it's equivalent to training a linear classifier because I, I just need the weights. I don't care about anything else by minimizing what's called the logistic loss. The lo minimizing the logistic loss is, so you know that max of uh, say negative f of x is the same as negative min over x, let's say. Of f of x. So I can pull the minus out. If I pull the minus out, the max becomes a min. And uh, there's a mistake on the slide. The blue box should not include the minus sign. So it's exactly the same as minimizing what's called the logistic loss. I could look at logistic regression using two different lenses. I could think of it as I'm working with this probabilistic model and I come to it from a Bayesian point of view. Or I could think of it as 
I need to find a linear classifier whose weights are W. And for reasons that I can not really articulate, today I'm going to minimize the logistic loss instead of the hinge loss or the perceptron loss, because this is what I have already written code for, or because this is what your homework demands. So these two things are equivalent to each other. These are just two different ways of looking at exactly the same mathematical objects. Any questions? This basically concludes our uh, exploration of maximum likelihood estimation, and we'll move on to maximum a posteriori. But before that, is there, are there any questions about MLE? Yeah. So, the optimization for this is uh, you can use stochastic gradient descent. And that's what your uh, homework, the first question, is kind of guiding you through deriving LCD for this thing. The hard part here is deriving the gradient of this thing. That's really the only difficult part. And then plugging it into SGD is almost another sort of a formulaic thing. So this is maximum likelihood estimation. In maximum likelihood estimation, remember, we assume that we have no prior information about the hypothesis. In other words, we assume that it, all, for all the weight vectors that exist in this d-dimensional space are equally likely because we know nothing. We could impose certain preferences. We could impose preferences that uh, may be motivated along in different ways. Uh, and those preferences can take the form of priors. So to go from maximum likelihood estimation to MLE, we can add priors. Uh, the, remember, the prior is a term in this thing that, uh, that talks about what can you tell me about the classifier before you see any data. One natural thing to think about is before you see any data, no feature is important, right? In the absence of any data, all features should be equally unimportant or equally weighted. A reasonable weight for all of them is zero because you know, you've not seen any, any data. So you have no reason to believe that feature number 518 should have any non-zero weight. The one way to impose that prior is to say, in the absence of any data, I believe that my weight each weight element comes from a normal distribution whose uh, center, whose mean is zero. So with the high, most probable weight in the absence of any data are the zero vector. Is a, is a zero vector instead of all weights are zero. Uh, that's kind of a reasonable prior because it says in the absence of any data, don't give any importance to any weight. And one way of, uh, um, doing that is to say that uh, you define this probability over the weight. Each weight in the weight vector wi is, first of all, independent of all the others. We are making this assumption because the math works out a little easier. And this expression is simply uh, the probability density of a normal distribution. So it's uh, one over uh, this is. Not the sigmoid, I realize now that I have the symbol sigma meaning two different things here. Here, sigma is just the standard deviation, it's a number. I have one over sigma root two pi, e power minus w i square divided by sigma square. This is simply the probability density of a normal distribution. So I could define my priors to be something like this. And given these priors, I can now start putting together, I have all the pieces I need to define map estimation for logistic regression. So I have my priors and let's work through this procedure again. What's the goal of uh, uh, map estimation? Remember in maximum likelihood estimation, our goal was to maximize the likelihood of the data. That's what we've already seen. In maximum a posteriori, estimation, we want to find, maximize the probability of the hypothesis given the data. Yeah. Which is equivalent to maximizing the product of the likelihood. And let me use S 
so that we uh, we are consistent with the notation. The, the likelihood times the probability of the prior. In our case, the hypothesis is uniquely defined by the weights. It's exactly the same as the weights. So the goal of maximum likelihood is maximum a posteriori estimation is to maximize the product of the likelihood term and the prior. We already know what to do with the likelihood term. We've already gone through it in some detail. So we won't focus on that for now. Um, so we seek to maximize the posterior probability of the model given the data, which is simply the same as maximizing the uh, product of the likelihood and the priors. We know how to write down the priors uh, in a functional form. It looks like this. We know how to write down the, uh, the uh, likelihood term, which is not written here, but it's essentially hidden inside the previous part. Let's just put it all together and we'll get like a whole mess of math on the slide. Our goal is our max of W given X, which is the same as our max of uh, over W of, uh, sorry, our max over W of P of W given S, which is the same as our max over W of uh, P of S given W times P of W. Same, we go through the same sort of, essentially the same steps again. Take the log, why? Because then product becomes sums. So we have uh, log of the likelihood term. This is exactly the log likelihood term that we saw before. Um, this thing here, plus the log of the prior term. Not going to work through the likelihood term because we already expanded it. And if you go through this process, if we are right here, if you go through this process, the likelihood term simply becomes a big summation over this thing here. Let's look at the prior. Well, we know what the prior looks like. It's exactly this expression here. But if we take the log, the, the product becomes a sum. So that really sum over j equals one to d. D is the dimensionality. So sum over every weight, the log of this expression here. Now, I'm not going to go over the really painful details here because uh, there are too many expressions for me to write it down clearly, but you should derive this to make sure that you know I'm not lying to you. So start if you take the log of the uh, the prior term, you get sum over all the weights, the sum of the squares of the weights divided by the sigma square. Sigma is the standard deviation that you pick, plus a whole bunch of terms that don't depend on the weights at all. Okay, so what kind of let's uh, step back. Our goal is to learn the weight vector by solving this optimization problem, namely um, max of S given W times P of W. Max of P of S given W times P of W. I took the log and I have break it down into two parts. The first part is simply the likelihood thing, which we have just done, we did before. And the second part is log of the prior. Uh, taking the log of the prior and getting rid of any expression that does not have a W in it, because our goal is to maximize the W. Getting rid of all the things that don't have a W in it leaves us with the sum of the negative squared weights times uh, one over sigma squared. We are trying to maximize over all the weights. So the constants don't really matter, so we can get rid of them. Does this look familiar? Well, let me write it slightly differently because uh, let me get rid of the constant. And I have maximum maximize over all weights. This is still math estimation. Okay. Maximize over all weights. The sum, this summation is over all the examples of this expression here, which is the log loss, plus, or in this case, minus. Notice that this here, sum of all the weight squares is exactly the dot product of a vector vector with itself, but with a negative sign. Right? What is, if I have a vector w, which is, let's say, just two elements, w1, w2, what is w transpose w? Is w1 squared plus w2 squared. The sum of the squares of a bunch of things is simply the dot product of that vector with itself. 
but there's a negative sign which we can pull out and there's a one over sigma square which we can pull out and so I can write this whole thing as this expression minus w transpose w divided by sigma square and we are still trying to maximize this expression we want to maximize this over the weight maximizing a negative function is exactly the same as minimizing uh, it requires the same effort as minimizing the function itself so I can get rid of these minuses and convert them to plus and convert this max to a min. So let's do that and move it aside. We have minimized the, the goal of uh, learning a logistic regression classifier using maximum a posteriori criterion is the same as minimizing the sum of these two terms. So question for you, where have you seen this before? Or where have you seen something like this before? Yeah. Uh, I can it's uh, some square. You have your and your regularizer and your loss function and your regularizer and your Yes. That's exactly what we have. We have a loss function. We have another term that doesn't depend on the data at all, but imposes a preference on the model. And that preference is saying that in the absence of any data, make the weight all zero. That's what this does. If this term did not exist, minimizing over W of W transpose W makes them all zero. So what we have here is exactly the same as it's an instance of the idea of learning as loss minimization. It just so happens that we have a new loss function here. The loss function we have, which is underlined, is called the logistic loss. The thing in the circle is a regularizer. Um, we did not invent a new regularizer here. This is just a new origin story for the same regularizer. When we were working with SPMs, we said it's good to minimize W transpose W because of this whole margin argument and WAPNIC and all that. Now, in the, pro, in the Bayesian setting, they're saying, it's good to minimize W transpose W because it corresponds to having a normal prior on the weight uh, and saying that all the weights without uh, any data, in, in, before you see any data, the expectation is that all weights are zero or they come from the normal distribution centered at zero. There's a sigma one over sigma square term. The one over sigma square term decides which of these two terms is more important. It behaves kind of like the C term. So sigma square behaves like C in this case, in the C that we saw in SVM. I saw some hands up, so yes. So you're saying sigma square is like C, but for the same as the prior to the W, all of this, should it be used that more initialized in the W that you can draw in a normal distribution of sigma? You could, but it turns out it's not going to matter because this is a convex function. This is a convex function. It has a single global minimum, doesn't matter where you initialize. I'll leave it as an exercise for you to prove that this is convex. Did you have a question? Yeah. Uh, so, if you're using a uh, theory of Almost definitely, yes, there's nothing at all. Uh, because the normal distribution has a two there. Yes. But it's not going to matter because you're going to just pick sigma square as a hyperparameter, pick two sigma square as a hyperparameter. You're right. There's Definitely a two missing uh, metric. Can you take a note? We can fix it later. There's also someone in the class in, on Zoom who mentioned that this reminds them of SVM and regularizer. So this we are coming to essentially a unification of ideas here. I will leave this as an exercise. In fact, I'll leave it as a homework question for you to invent the SGD algorithm for it. Or rather, implement, you have to derive the first, the theory part of your homework says, take this loss functions, derive stochastic gradient descent. For deriving stochastic gradient descent, you will essentially implement a, a procedure that is very much very similar to uh, how we derive stochastic gradient descent for SVM. And if that doesn't seem familiar, um, we will talk about that again when we talk about neural networks. But uh, it's like almost that is also almost like formulae. Turns out, SGD is not the only algorithm that exists uh, for optimizing. 
historically, for optimizing the logistic regression, for training the logistic regression classifier, uh, there used to be a, a, a family of algorithms called LBFDS. Uh, LBFDS stands for Limited Memory Dryden Fletcher Goldfarb Shannon. Um, uh, it's uh, not only is the name of the algorithm a mouthful, it's implementing it is also kind of a pain. Um, so you should be happy that uh, we live in the world of uh, stochastic gradient descent. And I'm not asking you to implement LBFDS for a homework. So um, I'll come back. Do you have a question? Yes. No, you, you, the, if you don't have the prior, you get maximum likelihood estimation. It is. No, that's not true. This function is convex in W. Um, it's not increasing in W. No, uh, work it out offline. It's not going to happen. It's not true. So, yeah. Um, uh, I see what you mean. I see what you mean, but uh, they it doesn't. It's not going to matter uh, because you're going to optimize only for a few steps. You, there's some limit for this. Okay. So logistic regression is a classifier that predicts the probability that the label is one. So it's a classifier that's defined in this probabilistic fashion. It turns out it's a discriminative classifier that uh, sometimes referred to as a discriminative counterpart of the naive base classifier. But since we decided to skip naive base. The second point may not mean much today. It's a discriminative classifier that's trained either that could be trained using map estimation or maximum likelihood estimation. You can also think of it as a discriminative classifier that's trained by minimizing the logistic loss over the training sets. All of these statements are true about logistic regression classifier. We have three minutes left. And I'm going to very quickly talk about learning at loss minimization again. I'm going to rush through slides that you've already seen just to kind of remind you of uh, the place of logistic regression in the loss minimization group. So our goal in this setting is to minimize the empirical loss over the training data uh, because the empirical loss behaves like, a, um, like an empirical estimate of the expected loss. Minimizing the empirical loss is a problem because uh, it can overfit, and so we have a regularizer that uh, prevents it from overfitting to the data. Um, the, there are many different regularizers that can exist, but one common choice is the Euclidean, the two norm, sometimes called the L2 regularizer, written this way here. Loss functions are the loss function part of it is supposed to penalize mistakes. The best loss is the zero one loss, which says if there's a mistake, you lose one point. If the label is correct, you don't lose a point. I can invent many different loss functions. You can have a perceptron loss, you can have hinge loss, you can have logistic loss, and you or the exponential loss. And all of these give you different named learning algorithms. Minimizing the perceptron loss gives you the perceptron algorithm. Minimizing the hinge loss gives you an SVI. Minimizing the logistic loss gives you the logistic regression model and minimizing the exponential loss gives you actually the Anabusta algorithm. And it turns out all of these are linear classifiers over the features. And for Anabusta, it's a linear classifier over the weak learners, like some massaging of ideas there, but essentially all of these are linear classifiers. If you want to see how they behave uh, as a plot, the zero one loss is a step function and the rest of them are essentially smooth or uh, sub-differentiable surrogate of the, the zero one loss. Logistic regression is a smooth loss fun, is a smooth surrogate, and they look all wildly different from each other. We've seen all of this before, that's why I'm kind of rushing through this. Uh, but if you actually zoom out in this picture, you see that they kind of behave similarly. As uh, this is y, y w transpose x. As y w transpose x is more and more positive, even for logistic regression, where that value never becomes zero, it's practically zero. And as YW transpose X becomes more and more negative, as the mistake becomes bigger and bigger, 
all of them, except the zero one loss, start imposing a bigger and bigger uh, penalty on misclassification. You can zoom out even more, and you notice that they basically behave the same way. And this is one of the reasons why logistic regression with proper hyperparameter tuning, SVM with proper hyperparameter tuning, average perceptron with proper hyperparameter tuning should give you kind of similar classification performance because they are essentially doing similar things. That's a good sort of a sanity check for you if you're implementing these things. There's also a connection to naive base, but I'm going to skip that part entirely because uh, not only are we out of time, we did not do naive base. I'll stop here. Um, go take a look at your homework. In theory, you have everything you need to do the homework. And if there are questions, you can I'll hang around here for a bit. Otherwise, I'll see you on Tuesday.